Over the past few lectures, we have seen several applications of the WKB method. We have also taken a look at the mathematics behind it rather closely. Now, the applications of the WKB method are numerous and it is difficult to do justice to this topic in a small number of lectures. But we have to draw a line somewhere. So, in today's lecture, we are going to talk about two very important applications of the WKB method. Different kinds of applications in a way compared to what we have done so far. The first one will be an application of the WKB method towards the understanding of tunneling to an arbitrary potential barrier. And the second one will be a way of understanding how classical mechanics approaches quantum mechanics through the example of a, a double well potential. There we will see that the classical mechanics picture and the quantum mechanics picture seem to be at variance to each other. But WKB actually allows you to form a bridge between the two using just the tunnel effect that we will talk about soon and show how and show how the quantum mechanical result is consistent with the classical one in the appropriate limit. We will next go on to indicate how the question of the classical limit of quantum problems can be treated in more depth using the WKB method. This is a huge topic and we will just be able to scratch the surface of it. We will end by sort of criticizing whatever we have been doing so far and trying to show you how you could improve upon the WKB method and derive, say, other connection formulas which will help to get more accurate final results. So let us now move on and talk about the phenomenon of tunneling. As you are all aware, Tunneling through a potential barrier is a uniquely quantum mechanical phenomenon by virtue of which a particle may land up in a region where it would classically have no access to. And you have definitely calculated the probability of tunneling through a rectangular barrier in an earlier class. What we are going to do here is try to generalize that problem to one of an arbitrarily shaped barrier and we will use a WKB method to figure out an approximate estimate for the tunneling probability in this case. Just to remind you that what we are considering is a situation where you have a potential barrier, not rectangular in this case, of some arbitrary shape as you can see in the blue curve in front of you. And very far to the left of the barrier and very far to the right of the barrier, the potential dies down to zero. So the particle will be a free particle very far to the left, at least as x approaches minus infinity, and a free particle as x approaches plus infinity. And the setup is one in which you imagine a particle is traveling in from the left, a part of the particle current is being reflected by the barrier, so you get a reflected wave which is given by Re by square root of p, it is a minus ipx by h cross. The incident wave is given by 1 by square root of p to the ipx by h cross. Note that this is a right going wave. You have to always remember that all these waves that we are talking about are really just the spatial part of the waves. The temporal part has an extra, it is a minus i omega t. When you take them together, it's easy to see that you have, it is the ipx by h cross minus omega t for the incident wave, which makes it a wave traveling to the right. Similarly, for the reflected wave, apart from the coefficient in front, you have an e to the minus ipx by h cross plus omega t, making it a wave traveling to the left. On the right hand side of the barrier, again very far away from the barrier, the particle behaves like a free particle, and you are going to get an e to the ipx by h cross by square root of p kind of behavior with a coefficient capital T of e. Now, if you were to calculate the currents which are transmitted and reflected respectively, it should be very easy for you to figure out that the mod square of the quantities T of E and R of E are respectively the transmission probability and the reflection probability. Our job right now is to try to estimate these two quantities based on the WKB approximation. Of course, the wave functions take the form e to the ipx by h cross or e to the minus ipx by h cross or a superposition of the two only very, very far away from the potential barrier, 
where the particle essentially behaves like a free particle. If you want to take into account what happens in the entire classically allowed region, that is to the left of the point marked x equal to a in the diagram and to the right of the point marked x equal to b. Note that in both these regions, the particle has a positive kinetic energy and total energy which is more than the potential energy. So these are the classically allowed regions. And in these regions, the wave function can be approximated rather well by the WKB approximation. That is on the right hand side for x greater than b, you are going to get T of E by root P into the I W B comma X. This W, remember, is a function which is given by 1 by H cross integral from B to X of P of X prime dx prime, P of X prime being the classical momentum. And on the left hand side, for X less than A, the incident wave will be given by the I W A comma X by 1 by root P. In addition to that, you will have a reflected piece which is capital R of E by root over P into the minus I W A comma X. Now, our strategy for tackling this problem using the WKB method will be as follows. We will start from the right hand side where we have only one term, the transmitted term. From that, we will work backwards or rather leftwards. So we will cross B and enter into the classically forbidden region using the connection formula for the turning point at B. Then we will again use the connection formula for the turning point at A in order to end up with an expression for the wave that you have on the left hand side for x less than A. We will then match this expression with the expression we expect that is 1 by root P to the I W A comma X plus Re by root P to the minus I W A comma X. And in doing so, we will read off the relationships between T and Re and the incident amplitude, which of course here is 1. So let us try to see how this is actually done. To begin with, we start with T E by root P to the I W B comma X, which is the form the W K B wave function takes to the right of the turning point B. Now, because this is a sinusoidal wave here, and for the sinusoidal waves, the connection formula has simple forms for cosine of W B comma X minus pi by 4 and sine of W B comma X minus pi by 4. What we are going to do is we are going to change the phase from e to the i w b comma x to e to the i w b comma x minus pi by 4. Of course, all you have to do is take an extra factor of e to the i pi by 4 outside for this to happen. And then what we will do is use the very famous formula e to the i theta is cos theta plus i sin theta to break up the exponential sinusoid into a cosine part and a sine part. The point is, once we cross the turning point and enter into the classically forbidden region, the cosine and the sine part are going to give rise to the exponentially decaying and exponentially increasing pieces respectively. So when you cross over to x less than b, the connection formula tells you that the wave function is going to be t into the, e to the i pi by 4 by root over p bar, t into the pi, i pi by 4 is just an overall constant, so it will just go there. Of course, in the connection formula, the 1 by root p becomes 1 by root p bar. But what is more important is the cosine of w b comma x minus pi by 4 will become half e to the minus w bar x comma b. Let me just remind you that in the last video, we discussed this quite extensively. The decaying term here means decaying as you move away from the turning point. That is, here actually the decaying term is the one which decays as you move to the further to the left, which of course is what we would usually call an increasing function in calculus. And that is the one which matches with the cosine and comes with a factor of half. The one which matches with the sine is the increasing uh, exponential. Once again, increasing here means increasing as you move away from the turning point. And because you have an extra i in front of the i sine omega b comma x minus pi by 4, you are going to get an i here too. And of course, you have a minus sign in the connection formula itself. No factor of half 
but a minus sign. So this is the form the wave function takes, at least the WKB wave function takes, once you enter into the forbidden region. Let me remind you once again that this is not the form which the wave function takes immediately close to the turning point, but this is what the correction formula will tell you. Is the form of the wave function sufficiently inside the forbidden region, not immediately at x equal to b. And then, let us ask ourselves what happens to this wave by the time you get to the other turning point, x equal to a. So when you are still in the forbidden region, that is x is still more than a, but nearly equal to a, notice that of these two terms, the one which is classically, which is decreasing, the decreasing exponential, the first term, essentially decays quite a lot. At least we are assuming that the two turning points are separated far enough for this to happen. And if that happens, to a very good approximation, you can ignore the first term completely. And you are now left with basically minus i coming from the second term in the bracket there, times t e to the i pi by 4 by square root of p bar times e to the power plus w bar x comma b. So that's the only term which survives by the time you get to the other turning point. Now what we are going to do is we are going to rewrite this so that we can write this as an exponential which is changing as you move away from this turning point, the turning point a. Now w bar x power b is simply an integral, apart from this 1 by h cross factor of course, of p bar x prime dx prime from x to b. Now, an integral from x to b is, of course, the same as an integral from a to b minus the integral from a to x. Using that, the exponential can easily be broken up into two pieces, two factors e to the w bar a comma b and e to the minus w bar a comma x. The reason we do that is, note, that now that we are close to the turning point a, the decreasing exponential which is going to connect to the sinusoid on the other side is exactly to the minus w bar a comma x. The rest of the factors which you have here, namely minus i capital T e e to the i pi by 4 by root over p bar e to the w bar a comma b, these are basically overall factors. Of course, 1 by root over p bar is not really an overall factor, it's part of the wave function. When you go on to the other side, the 1 by root over p bar will be replaced by 1 by root over p. So, that is exactly what we are going to do now. Let's move on to the other side, when x is less than a. So everything else just carries over an, as an factor. 1 by root p bar is replaced by 1 by root p according to the standard correction rules. And it is a minus w bar a comma x connects with twice cosine w x comma a minus pi by 4. Once again, it's w x comma a because what should really be sitting inside the cosine is mod of the w. And w x comma a is what is positive when x is less than a. Just note that the overall factor has now become minus i t e into the i pi by 4 into the w bar a comma b. So we have essentially achieved our objective. We have started from the right hand side. The tunneling part of the wave function crossed the two turning points, used the connection formula twice and now we have landed up on the left where we know that what we should really have is an incident wave, that is a wave of the kind e to the i w x comma a, and a reflected wave, a wave of the kind e to the minus i w x comma a. On this side, we know what we should have is an incident wave e to the i w a comma x, and a reflected wave where the x dependence is e to the minus i w a comma x. Let me remind you once again, that although w x comma a is what we have in used inside the cosine, for a right going wave you must need it the plus i w a comma x because that's the function which is going to increase when x rises. So what we need to do is to write the cosine that you see inside this expression, cosine of w x comma a minus pi by 4 in terms of the exponentials, which is actually pretty straightforward. You just write twice cosine as e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta. And then 
the only thing left is to break up the two terms into two pieces and then also notice that what you really need to do is change the wx comma a into wa comma x but that is easily done it just takes a minus sign and so the next step will be the overall factor minus i t e to the w bar a comma b by root p note that the root p bar has of course changed to root p it is a minus i w a comma x this is the wave which is traveling to the left that is the wave which is reflected plus t e to the w bar a comma b by root p it is a w i w a comma x now this must compare with what we have on the left hand side which is just the incident wave 1 by root p to the i w a comma x in addition to the reflected wave r e by root p it is a minus i w a comma x now our job is clear all we have to do is compare the coefficients of the expression that we have obtained by applying the connection formula twice that is the expression in purple on the top line with the expression that we expect the one in blue and this immediately gives us two relations. Firstly, it tells us that minus i t e to the w bar a comma b, this coefficient must be r e, the reflection coefficient, and t e to the w bar a comma b must be 1. So this immediately gives us two results. One is r e, the reflection coefficient simply works out to be minus i. This is something which you get by just dividing the two. And this gives, tells us that the reflectance is 1, r e mod square. Of course, if the reflectance is exactly 1, you would expect the transmittance to be 0, because r plus t, of course, has to be 1. Please note, however, that this is an approximate result within the framework of the WKB approximation. Here, reflectance is 1 simply means that the transmittance has to be very, very small, not really 0. And we can easily see that TE works out to be it is a minus W bar A comma B and hence the probability of transmission, transmittance is simply it is a minus twice W bar A comma B and re replacing W bar by its expression, we get this transmittance formula. It is a minus 2 by H cross integral from A to B of square root of twice M Vx minus E Dx. So basically, all you have to do is find the two turning points, carry out this integral, put that in, up in the exponent. As long as the integral which you have here is large compared to h cross, what you are going to get is a pretty decent approximation to the problem simply because, remember, WKB after all is a small h cross approximation. And in that small h cross limit, this transmittance is going to be very, very tiny. So the fact that the reflectance is 1 should not really bother you because at least to order h cross, transmittance is also 0. Now, one of the early triumphs of WKB theory was an explanation of alpha decay. That is a decay in which a heavy nucleus X decays into a daughter nucleus Y and an alpha particle, which as you all know, is a nucleus of the helium atom. Now, a theory of alpha decay had to deal with an extraordinary range of parameters. While the ranges of alpha particles, here by range I mean the distance an alpha particle would penetrate into matter, these ranges were spread by a relatively small amount. The lifetimes of the nuclei had a remarkable variation from seconds to thousands of years. Yet it seemed that these two quantities were correlated to each other. Another problem that plagued early theories of alpha decay came from a class of experiments that you are all familiar with. These were essentially the same kind of experiments as the ones which Rutherford did when he shot alpha particles at thin gold foils, the scattering of alpha particles from nuclei. It was determined experimentally that the scattering of alpha particles that were produced naturally of very high energies or the highest energies that were available could be explained very nicely by Rutherford's calculation. The only problem was 
Rutherford's calculation of the scattering formula assumed only the 1 by r potential, that is, the inverse square repulsive Coulomb force between the nucleus and the alpha particle. On the other hand, the fact that nuclei exist at all and the alpha particles were inside the nucleus shows that there is a strong interaction, something stronger than the electromagnetic repulsion which keeps the nucleus together. It so turned out that these ex scattering experiments showed no sign whatsoever of these strong interactions. What that meant was that the alpha particles that were being used did not have enough energy to penetrate all the way into the core of the nucleus where the alpha strong interactions would manifest themselves. On the other hand, alpha particles inside the nucleus had comparable energies and they could come out of the nucleus overcoming the strong interaction force. Now this was a puzzle and is classically it would have been impossible for alpha particles for that small an energy to overcome the huge attractive barrier which the strong interaction must have produced in order to prevent the nucleus from disintegrating under the effect of the repulsive forces, the Coulomb repulsive forces. Now the person who came up with the first theory of the alpha decay was George Gamow and he based this entirely on the quantum mechanical theory of tunneling and did the calculation based on WKB approximation. Because no detailed understanding of the strong interaction that bound the nucleus together was available at the time, Gamow resorted to a very simple model. He knew that the alpha particles that were shot at the nuclei could manage to penetrate very close to the center and yet show no deviation whatsoever from the Coulomb potential effects. And hence, Gamow was sure that the strong interactions were of very short range indeed. So what he did was to model the strong interaction by essentially a spherical well. Up to a distance r0, the potential, the binding potential was taken to be minus u0, something which kept the alpha particle and other nucleons inside the nucleus. Gamow assumed that the strong interaction died out completely and abruptly at R0. And for R bigger than R0, you only had effect of the Coulomb potential C by R, where C is a standard constant in the Coulomb force law. Q1, Q2 by 4 pi epsilon 0, the standard constant that you get in Coulomb's law. Here, since the alpha particle itself had a charge of twice E, E being the magnitude of the electronic charge, and the daughter nucleus, which was left repelling away, the alpha particle, after it got out of the nucleus, had a charge of z minus 2e, c actually turns out to be 2 into z minus 2e square by 4 pi epsilon 0. Note that if you had shot the alpha particle with an energy e back at the nucleus, it would have only penetrated up to a distance of r1, the distance r1 of course being given by the relation c by r1 is equal to E. That's the turning point at which an alpha particle shot at the nucleus would turn and go back all the way to infinity. So C by R1 is of course equal to E which is entirely kinetic. So it's given by half mv square where v is the velocity of the alpha particle. It was further assumed in Gamow's theory that in a radioactive nucleus which underwent an alpha decay, the alpha particle was already there all the time inside the nucleus, or at least it was created inside the nucleus a short while before the decay actually took place. Now this alpha particle was trapped inside the spherical potential well of radius r0 and depth minus u0. Classically it would have been impossible for this alpha particle to come out of the nucleus because its energy was only E, something you could measure, after it, it had come out and had moved a long distance away from the nucleus. This energy was simply not enough to overcome the height of the barrier V0. So what Gamow did was make use of the newly discovered quantum theory of tunneling to explain how this alpha particle which was trapped inside the spherical potential well could come out of the nucleus and hence cause alpha decay. So what he did and what we are going to do now 
is calculate the probability of tunneling of the alpha particle with energy E so that you could figure out what is the probability that the alpha particle which impinges on the wall of the spherical well can come out of the nucleus and move very far away from it. As we have seen a while ago, the probability that an alpha particle will tunnel out can be given by this WKB approximation to be e to the minus twice W bar R0, R1. And when you write that out in terms of the potential energy, what you get is e to the power minus 2 by h cross integral from R0 to R1 of the quantity square root of twice m into C by R minus E dr. Now, after this, you can do a few manipulations to simplify the integrand. For example, you can take twice m e or rather square root of that out of, the, out of the integral completely. Square root of twice m e is nothing but mv and that is what is sitting outside the integral here. And you will be left with an integral of r1 by r minus 1 square root with respect to r from r0 to r1. An obvious substitution here would be r by r1 is equal to x. And if you do that and write down the integral in terms of x, it turns out to be thus this rather elementary integral, an integral of square root of 1 by x minus 1 dx from r0 by r1, which is the lower limit for x, to the upper limit, which is 1. And it is pretty easy to see that the, the, the change from dr to dx gives you an extra factor of r1. And when you combine that with the mv which you have, the coefficient in front can be written as 4c by h cross v. Now this integral is certainly elementary and you can calculate it to be cos inverse of square root of r0 by r1 minus square root of r0 by r1 into 1 minus r0 by r1. Now, in our theory, R0 is definitely a lot, lot smaller than R1. R1, remember, is the distance to which that alpha particle shot in at the given energy of the decaying alpha particle would have penetrated. Whereas R0 is the distance at which the strong interactions manifest themselves. Since R0 by R1 is very much smaller than 1, you can actually approximate this pretty well by replacing cos inverse square root of R0 by R1 by cos inverse 0, which is pi by 2, and replacing the 1 minus R0 by R1 inside the square root by just 1. Indeed, for most practical purposes, you can just con consider the first term minus 4c by h cross v times pi by 2. So, basically, the tunneling probability works out to be e to the power minus 2 pi c by v h cross and replacing the value of c gives you 2 pi alpha into 2 by z minus 2 by v by c, where alpha is nothing but the fine structure constant e squared by 4 pi 7 0 h cross c. Now that we have the tunneling probability, we can relate it to the better known and more easily measurable quantity, the decay constant. This is a familiar quantity that tells us how likely a nucleus is to undergo a decay. The probability dn by n that a nucleus capital X will decay in time t is given by minus gamma dt. This leads us to the famous radioactive decay equation n equals n0 is a minus gamma t. Now it is easy to see that this quantity gamma is nothing but the product of the number of times an alpha particle goes and hits the wall of our spherical well and the probability that one such impact is going to lead to the alpha particle's escape, that is, the tunneling probability. So, gamma is essentially given by the probability of tunneling P divided by capital T, which is the time period of oscillation of the alpha particle inside the well. Now, this 1 by T, of course, has a velocity dependence, but the major part of the velocity and hence the energy dependence in this decay constant comes from the exponential. So if you take the log of gamma, what you get essentially is some factors which depend on energy rather weakly, rather like log of the energy, but the dominant term is going to be minus some constant capital A divided by square root of energy. 
the square root of energy, of course, comes from the 1 by V in the exponent. This is the famous geiger nuttall law, which has been verified over and over again in experiments. In fact, a version of the geiger nuttall law was known even before Gamow's theoretical calculations. Gamow actually gave us a better version of the geiger nuttall law, and it turned out that this law actually was a very, very good fit to experimental data. As I said, this was a major triumph of quantum mechanics in its very early days. Now, the next topic that we are going to discuss is a very important one in its own right. This is the double well potential, a problem which has actually given rise to quite a lot of different techniques. It has been solved by various methods, very advanced methods like instant and techniques, which we are not going to be able to discuss in this class or by an application of the WKB method. But what is really important here is that this particular potential leads to a problem which is at the heart of the connection between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, in particular between the way in which quantum mechanics and classical mechanics treats symmetries. We are going to consider the symmetric double well. Please excuse my rather poor drawing, but you have to sort of admit that this is almost approximately symmetrical even despite my pure drawing skills. Here, we consider a particle with energy capital E shown by the green horizontal line. Now, classically, a particle with this particular energy capital E will either be found oscillating in the left well between minus B and minus A or in the right well between the turning points A and B. According to classical mechanics, a particle which is in the left well will have absolutely no chance of landing up in the right-hand well, simply because it will not have enough energy to cross the hump in the middle. As a result, a classical solution of the equations of motion here breaks the parity symmetry which this potential has. The potential has an x going to minus x symmetry, but the solution will either have a particle confined within minus a to minus b or between a to b. Now, notice that here, a given solution to the classical equations of motion will not have the symmetry of the potential, whereas the entire class of all solutions will. In other words, for every solution in which a particle is confined to the left-hand well, there will be a corresponding solution in which the particle is confined to a right-hand well. Individual solutions, however, will break the parity symmetry. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, says that the energy eigenfunctions for this parity symmetric Hamiltonian must have a definite parity. That is, the wave functions must be either even or odd. So this actually tells us the symmetry manifests quite differently in the same system, depending on whether you are using classical physics to understand it or quantum physics. On the other hand, we expect that quantum mechanics should reproduce the classical result if the barrier height is very large. If you have very huge barrier in the middle, then a particle in the left-hand well should not even be aware of the existence of the right-hand well. And in the limit, in the classical limit, h cross going to zero, of course, we would expect even quantum mechanics to sort of tell you that a particle in the left-hand well will stay in the left-hand well, and so on, despite the fact that the energy eigenstates are symmetrically distributed between both wells. So, how do you reconcile these two apparently inconsistent statements, especially in the view that in some limit, quantum mechanics should reproduce the classical results? So, consistency between these two apparently completely contradictory pictures is brought about by the tunnel effect, the thing that we have been studying so far. To understand the role that tunneling plays in this, let us consider just the lowest two states of this particular problem the ground state and the first excited state. Now here, as a basis for this particular problem, we can choose the two states phi plus and phi minus. These are states localized in the right-hand well and the left-hand well respectively. So if a system is in the state phi plus, it is sure to be found on the right-hand well and not in the left-hand well. And similarly for phi minus. Now the Hamiltonian which describes the system would have been a diagonal Hamiltonian with just E0 sitting on the diagonals. The two diagonal elements would be 
equal because of the parity symmetry of the problem if phi plus and phi minus had been the energy eigenstates. Now this would have been the picture if there had been no possibility of a particle found on phi plus turning up in phi minus as time evolves. However, we do know that a particle which is in the right hand well can be found in the left hand well according to quantum mechanics and this is where tunneling comes in. So there is a probability amplitude for the particle to transit from phi plus to phi minus and this manifests itself as off-diagonal terms in the Hamiltonian. And because of the fact that the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, you would expect the off-diagonal terms to be complex conjugates of each other. Here we can take the tunneling amplitude to be simply a real quantity epsilon. So epsilon is the tunneling amplitude between the two wells and it has to be proportional to the tunneling probability which we know from WKB theory to be e to the bar minus W bar where W bar has been calculated from minus A to plus A. The entire gap between the two turning points which essentially is in the forbidden region. Now the diagonalization of this particular Hamiltonian is a trivial task and one which you must have carried out lots of times before. The eigenstates of this particular Hamiltonian will simply be 1 by root 2 times 5 plus plus 5 minus a state which I'm going to call psi 1 and 1 by root 2 5 plus minus 5 minus a state which I'm going to call psi 2. And it is very easy to see that the energy difference between these two states, E2 minus E1, is actually proportional to the tunneling amplitude or epsilon. It is obvious that phi plus plus phi minus by root 2, that is the state psi 1, is symmetric between the two wells, so it's symmetric under parity, and phi plus minus phi minus by root 2, psi 2, is antisymmetric under parity. So this returns to us our notion that the quantum mechanical eigenstates for the full problem, which takes into account that a particle can tunnel between the two wells, turns out to have either symmetric or antisymmetric energy eigenstates. Now, how does this help reconcile the problem between the classical picture that a particle is in one well will stay in that well and the quantum picture that a particle has a wave function which is symmetric between the two wells or antisymmetric between the two wells? Note that in both the two cases, the probability amplitude in the two wells will have to be equal. Now, for this particular Hamiltonian, the time evolution of an arbitrary wave function psi of t is easy enough. It is simply going to be c1 psi1 e to the minus e1 t by h cross plus c2 psi2 e to the minus e2 t by h cross, psi1 and psi2 being the two energy eigenstates. And the constant c1 and c2 basically can be figured out by the initial condition that is, by the, from the wave function psi zero. Now, if I start with a particle in the right-hand well, that is, if psi zero is phi plus, one by root two psi one plus psi two, c one and c two can be easily read off to be one by root two. And therefore, psi of t is going to turn out to be one by root two times psi one e to the minus i e one t by h cross, plus psi two e to the minus i e two t by h cross. Now, what is the probability that at a time t, the particle will be found in the state phi minus, that is, it will be found in the left-hand well. The answer is straightforward. You just have to take the overlap between phi minus and psi of t, and this is going to give you half of e to the minus i e1 t by h cross minus e to the minus i e2 t by h cross. This, of course, is the probability amplitude. The modular square of this is the probability of finding the particle in the left-hand well, given that it has started out in the right-hand one. This probability, probability of finding the particle which was in plus going over to minus, hence the p plus to minus notation, is easily seen to be sine square of delta e into t by 2h cross. That's just the modular square of this quantity overlap between phi minus and psi of t. Now let us take a look at this quantity. This of course starts out very small for 0t and stays very small for a long time if this quantity twice h cross by delta e is large. In other words, the particle will be in the other well after a time, which you can estimate by putting the finding out the quantity, finding out the time at which p plus going to minus will be 1, and that is simply given by pi h cross by delta e, or which is something which is proportional to h cross by epsilon, the tunneling probability. And as we have seen, the tunneling probability is 
it is a minus w bar. So the time period, the time after which you will find the particle in the other well is roughly given by h cross e to the power w bar. When the time small t is much, much less than this capital T, the particle is effectively localized in one well. On the other hand, when you're looking at stationary states, there is no such time limit. A stationary state is something which is going to stay there forever, which means you can look at the system for a very, very, very long time indeed. Only when you look at the system for a very, very long time, you find that it is equally likely to be in the right-hand well and the left-hand well simply because the probability keeps on oscillating between one well and the other. So, if the tunneling probability is too low, that is, if the barrier is too high, you are going to have a very, very large time over which the particle will be effectively confined in one well. Now, you might be a bit confused by the H cross which is appearing in capital T. This seems to suggest that in the limit H cross goes to zero, the time that it will take for a particle to switch from one well to the other will actually vanish. But that is, of course, what should not happen because the limit h cross going to zero is a classical limit where the particle should stay in one well forever. But note that w bar has a one by h cross. What that means is that in the limit h cross going to zero, the exponent is going to diverge and the e to the bar w bar quantity is going to exponentially blow up, giving rise to an infinitely big capital T. So in the limit h cross going to zero, quantum mechanics is going to tell us that a particle will stay confined to one of the wells, the well one in which it started out from, which is exactly what classical mechanics tells us. Now what we are going to do next is we are going to use the WKB method to estimate this epsilon, the tunneling amplitude from one well to the other. So let us now take a look at the double well potential via the WKB method. Now, the procedure that we are going to adopt should be very familiar by now. It's essentially what we did when we treated the tunneling problem. We will start from the right-hand side, that is, for x bigger than b, and then slowly work our way across the various turning points. Now, because we know that the wave function is going to be either symmetric, that is, for the ground state, or anti-symmetric for the first excited state, I don't really have to go all the way across to large negative x values. We just need to figure out what happens for positive x. The result for negative x will automatically follow. The difference between the tunneling problem and this one is that here for x bigger than b, the particle is actually in the classically forbidden region. So the wave function has to be the decaying exponential 1 by root over p bar e to the minus w bar b comma x. And using our connection formula, we find that once we enter into the allowed region, that is for x, less than b, you end up with the wave function 1 by root p times twice cosine w x comma b minus pi by 4. We next need to look at what will happen when we cross the turning point at x equal to a and for that we need to focus on the quantity w a comma x. So what we do is we rewrite w x comma b in terms of w a comma p minus w a comma x. And then we actually play a small trick. Note that in order to figure out the connection between the cosines in the classically allowed region and the exponentials in the classically forbidden region, what we would need is the quantity w a comma x minus pi by 4. Whereas in, at this state w a comma x and pi by 4 come with the same sign. But we can easily come up with a different sign simply by realizing that minus pi by 4 is nothing but plus pi by 4 minus pi by 2 and use the standard result that cosine of theta minus pi by 2 is the same as cosine of pi by 2 minus theta, hence sine theta. And that gives us the result that this expression is exactly the same as 2 by root p sine w a comma b minus w a comma x plus pi by 4. Or you can rewrite this as minus 2 by root p sine of w a comma x minus pi by 4 minus w a comma b. Now we are in a position to apply the connection formula or 
we are almost in the in a position to do that. All you really need to do is use our class 11 trigonometric formula of our sine of a minus b and read and break this up into two pieces sine w a comma x minus pi by 4 into cosine w a comma b and cosine w a comma x minus pi by 4 times sine w a comma b. Now that we have this, we can easily use the connection formula to figure out what is going to happen when x is less than a. So the first piece, the minus 2 by root p cosine w a comma b is multiplied by sine w a comma x minus pi by 4. This will give you a change of sign and an increasing exponential into the plus w bar x comma a. Note that once again we mean an exponential which increases as you move away from the turning point, in this case to the left. The other term which had twice sine w a comma b by root p will become sine w a comma b by root p bar e to the minus w bar x comma a. Note that we have taken into account the fact that there is a minus sign which comes with the sinusoid or the ex increasing exponential and a plus sign and a half which comes in with the decreasing exponential here. Now let us try to figure out the condition that this will give us the ground state. We know that the ground state has to be an even function and so it is better to rewrite this in a form which will make it easy to understand whether it is an even function or not. So instead of the w bar x comma a, it is better to write it in terms of w bar 0 comma x simply because it's easier to figure out what happens to w bar 0 comma x when you change the sign of x. w bar 0 comma minus x is exactly the same as minus w bar minus x comma 0. Interchanging the two limits of course changes the sign. On the other hand, because of the symmetry of the potential, w bar minus x comma 0 has to be the same as w bar 0 comma x. So what we find is that w bar 0 comma minus x is negative of w bar 0 comma x. Using this and the fact that e to the w bar x comma a is nothing but e to the w bar 0 comma a e to the minus w bar 0 comma x, that is the product of these two exponents, it is easy to see that our wave function in the region between x equal to 0 and x equal to a takes this particular form here. And in order that this turns out to be an even function, you must have this result. That the coefficient of e to the minus w bar 0 comma x must match the coefficient of e to the plus w bar 0 comma x. Remember that when we carry out the parity operation, change x to minus x, these two functions are simply going to switch over and therefore the two coefficients must be the same if you have to get an even function. So for the ground state, you must have twice cosine w a comma b e to the w bar 0 comma a is equal to sine w a comma b e to the minus w bar 0 comma a. Or in other words, cotangent of w a comma b must be the same as half of e to the minus w bar minus a comma a. Note e to the minus w bar of minus a comma a is nothing but the tunneling amplitude between the two turning points which demarcate the forbidden region here. And if we call that the constant capital K, we get this result cotangent of w a comma b is has to be k by 2. And this is what gives me the condition that will give us the ground state energy. The first excited state energy can be found out using very similar methods except that the first excited state must be an odd function. So two coefficients of e to the w bar 0 comma x and, and e to the minus w bar 0 comma x must be negatives of each other which means you must have twice cosine w a comma b e to the w bar 0 comma a equal to minus sine w a comma b e to the minus w bar 0 comma a that is cot of w a comma b must be minus k by 2. Going back to the ground state, for most practical situations, the tunneling rate must be, or the tunneling amplitude capital K must be very, very small. So cotangent of w a comma b is nearly 0 and therefore w a comma b must be around pi by 2. So to exploit this, what we do is write w a comma b as pi by 2 minus mu, where we know mu has to be a small number. Of course, cotangent of pi by 2 minus mu is simply tan of mu and 
for small mu that's almost mu so we find mu to be around k by 2 in case you are wondering why i interpreted the fact that cotangent of w a comma b equal to k by 2 is a small positive quantity as a sign that w a comma b is close to pi by 2 and not for example 5 pi by 2 let me remind you that we are looking at the ground state and for the ground state of this system if you had only a single well with no tunneling possibilities and turning points at a and b the condition would have been w a comma b equals pi by 2 remember in general w a comma b is n plus half times pi and for the ground state n is 0 so the smallest possible value half pi is what w a comma b would have if there were no possibilities of tunneling to other locations which the particle could go to so this particular expression that we have w a comma b equals pi by 2 minus k by 2 given by this integral 1 over h cross integral from a to b twice m square root of e minus v of x dx if you were to put k equal to 0 in here you would get the semi-classical approximation for e0 which is the energy that a single well without any possibility of tunneling to another well would have had in order to figure out exactly how much the energy shifts because of the tunneling let me remind you that capital k is a small quantity so the right hand side differs from pi by 2 the value which would have given e0 for e by a very small quantity for a small k we would expect the variation in the energy delta e to also be small and thus varying the energy e to e0 plus delta e on the left hand side simply gives you from elementary calculus this result half e to twice m delta e which simply comes from the derivative of square root of twice m e minus vx of course the derivative actually changes the square root twice m e minus vx by 1 by square root twice m e minus vx and so you end up with this particular condition delta e times m by h cross integral from a to b dx by square root of twice m e minus v of x is equal to the variation on the right hand side which is simply minus k by 2. Now let me point out that the denominator square root of twice m e minus v of x is nothing but the momentum and if you cancel out the mass that is sitting there on the left hand side you simply get dx by velocity so all that you're doing in the integral is integrate dx by v from a to b which is to say you're finding out the total time it takes for the particle to go from a to b which is half of the time period for oscillations thus delta e is related to k by this relation delta e into t by twice h cross is minus half k and by moving capital T to the other side and expressing it in terms of omega, you get delta E is minus h cross omega by twice pi times capital K. Thus, the energy E1 for the ground state turns out to be E0 minus h cross omega by twice pi capital K. Note that just as perturbation theory had told you, the energy shift is proportional to the tunneling probability. Or tunneling amplitude. Now you could very similarly work out E2, the first excited state's energy. Of course, for that you will have to take the, an anti-symmetric state. So start with a minus sign in front of the two coefficients of e to the minus w0 comma x and e to the plus w0 comma x. This will essentially give you the same calculation with just a change in the sign of k, and so E2 will turn out to be E0 plus h cross omega by twice pi into capital K. The energy shift delta E is simply h cross omega by pi into capital K, which agrees completely with our conclusion a while ago. The energy shift that we had worked out using our simple two level model was that the energy shift is proportional to epsilon, the amplitude for tunneling between one well and the other. That is exactly what our WKB method is telling us. So here we can use the WKB method to make more concrete our supposition 
the tunneling between one well and the other actually leads to a split in the energy levels. As we have just seen, the WKB approximation gives us a nice way of understanding the connection between the classical picture of a system and its corresponding quantum mechanical picture. Now this should be easily understandable since the WKB approximation formally follows from a power series expansion in powers of h bar and so it is easy to see that when h bar can be treated as a small quantity that is for systems where the typical action or rather changes in action are large compared to the value of h bar WKB should be a good way to understand such systems. Now this connection between the classical and the quantum version of a system or in more general terms the idea of the classical limit of a quantum system is actually quite an involved one and it is still a matter of active research. There are a lot of things here which we still don't understand perfectly well. But progress is being made all the time. One of the major tools that we have in such an endeavor is the WKB approximation. Now we are not really in a position to explain this entire approach to the classical limit via the WKB approximation in this course. That would take us, in fact, almost an entire course devoted to the WKB approximation and its associated applications. What we are going to do in the next few minutes is to give you an indication as to how WKB sort of allows you to talk about the classical version of a quantum system. To see this, what we will do is we will fall back on our old friend, the Borsama felt quantization condition, which I've written here, 1 over 2 pi h cross, integral over of p dx over a complete cycle is simply n plus half. We are going to use this particular Borsama felt quantization condition to figure out an estimate for the er energy gap between levels of a quantum system in the limit of large n. Note that when n is very large, then the spacing between two neighboring levels, which corresponds to delta n equals 1, the energy spacing in particular, delta E, which is En plus 1 minus En, can be considered to be a rather small quantity in comparison. And then what we can do is vary both sides with respect to E and essentially treat delta E as almost an infinitesimal quantity. What this allows us to do is that it gives us delta n equal to 1 from the variation of the right hand side of the Bohr's overfill quantization condition. And the left hand side gives you 1 by twice pi h cross delta e times the derivative of the cyclic integral pdx with respect to e. Now, of course, the derivative of this integral essentially translates to the integral of del p del e. And del p del e, as you can easily see from the classical formula, is simply m by p. So delta n, which is equal to 1, turns out to be equal to 1 by twice pi h cross delta e times the cyclic integral of m dx by p. And this is very familiar to all of you. m by p, after all, is reciprocal of the velocity. So dx by v integrated over a complete cycle is nothing but the time period. And thus, what we get is 1 equals delta e by h cross omega. And this immediately tells me that once you go to highly enough excited states, that is for large enough n, the spacing between energy levels will all be equal to h cross omega. So you get a series of equally spaced energy levels. Thus for large values of n, all these levels become equally spaced. And not only that, the frequency of transition between any two levels, not just successive levels, but any two levels, is a multiple of the fundamental frequency omega. If you look at the wave function for such a highly excited state, it will of course not be a wave function which has contributions only from one state, but a bunch of levels. So psi of xt will be given by psi kx summed over all k at t equal to zero, but as time evolves, you will get psi xt is sum over k psi kx times it is a minus i e t by h cross. But since all the energies are equally spaced, I can take out an overall phase factor. 
and replace the e to the minus i e t by h cross in the sum by simply e to the minus i k omega t. So this is exactly like the way in which a periodic function with a period of 2 pi by omega would behave. Because this particular expansion of the wave function is nothing but a Fourier series for a periodic function. Now, what we are actually talking about here is a situation where a classical description works well. Classical description works well when the quantum numbers involved are large, so n has to be much, much bigger than 1. But we also have to bear in mind one thing. No matter how high n is, a state which is a definite energy eigenstate is as far away from a classical system as possible. So what we need really is not a definite energy eigenstate, but a superposition of lots of energy eigenstates. You need a spread of n. The spread should not be so big that it overshadows the fact that you have a well-defined n in the first place, but this spread should also be much, much bigger than 1. So the condition for a classical description to work well is that the system be described by a wave function which is a superposition of lots of different energy levels corresponding to a large spread of delta n, but the average n, the average of this spread, spread out quantum numbers, must be much, much bigger than this delta n. Now, if you look at the time evolution of any observable quantity in such a state, the expectation value of the quantity f bar will evolve in time according to a standard quantum mechanical prescription, which says shy of t bra f operator shy of t ket. And this, of course, can be expanded out by using an expansion of shy of t in terms of the wave functions, individual energy eigenfunctions, as sum over m and n of cm star cn fmn, fmn being the overlap bra m operator f ket n, these m and n are really nothing but the in individual energy eigenstates, or short for shy m and shy n, really, times the time-dependent factor into the i by h cross e m minus e n into t. Notice that this, while this is perfectly true for any system whatsoever, or any state of the system whatsoever, if your state of the system obeys this classical limit restrictions, that is, you if you have a large enough n set that so that all the energy eigenvalues are equally spaced, you can replace the sum over m and n by a sum over n and k by changing m to n plus k, and what you will end up with is cn plus k star for cm star, cn, f n plus k comma n, but what is most important is instead of the, of the time dependent factor into the i by h cross e m minus e n t, you can now write into the i k omega t. Once again, what we are exploiting is the fact that the energy levels are all equally spaced. And this, if you replace, if you carry out the sum over n, you simply end up with a sum over k, which goes like sum over k, some quantity f k bar times e to the i k omega t. What that this actually implies that the time evolution of any dynamical quantity, at least when you are close to the classical limit, would be essentially periodic, and you can write down f bar t entirely in terms of its Fourier components f bar k. Now, while all this might seem very very trivial, let me point out that when you go to small n's. The energy levels are usually not equally spaced, except, of course, for that one system which we use all the time, the harmonic oscillator. For most systems, the energy levels are not equally spaced at lower values of n. And so this particular result, that you can write down the time evolution, the quantum mechanical time evolution of the expectation value of an operator, essentially in terms of its Fourier components, and like a periodic Fourier series, works only in the classical limit for most systems. Now, there's an interesting historical sidelight to this. When Heisenberg built up his quantum mechanics, he actually did, the, he actually followed the, he actually followed a route which was exactly opposite to this one. He started out by with the basic idea that in classical physics, most systems behave 
at least approximately like a periodic system, at least under small oscillations. And most physical quantities can be expressed in terms of Fourier series with their Fourier coefficients. And then he tried to figure out the rules by which these Fourier coefficients would interact among each other. And the kind of funny set of rules that he found out for them essentially gave rise to matrix mechanics, which is Heisenberg's which is Heisenberg's version of quantum mechanics. So, in a way, this brief introduction to how quantum mechanics can be used to reproduce, in a sense, so in a way, this brief introduction to how quantum mechanics via the WKB approximation can be used to reproduce classical mechanics at some level, can also give us an insight as to how quantum mechanics itself got born. Now, this, as I have said, is a very, very immense topic. And so, I will not really say much more about this. We have already spent a long time discussing the WKB approximation. And it's high time that we sort of move on to other topics. I will just point out one thing before I finish this. One of the most important results that we have used over and over again in this particular description of the WKB method is that of the connection formula. And we have derived the connection formula very rigorously and had done and have done quite a lot of intense mathematics to justify that. But let me point out that there is a bit of a worry about this, at least in some situations. Note that in deriving the connection formulas, what we did was linearize the potential close to the turning point and then take the exact solution for the linearized problem, which are in terms of the IRD functions, and use the asymptotics of the IRD functions in order to match the WKD wave functions far enough away from the turning point. But this, of course, assumes that the linear behavior for the potential can be used for quite a long distance, in fact, at least for a sufficiently long distance, so that the IRD function is well approximated by its asymptotic form. In other words, actually what we are really assuming here is that the potential stays approximately linear over a distance which is several wavelengths for this corresponding WKB wave function. Now while this is true in many systems, there are certainly situations where this does not work. And one case where this definitely does not work is when you have two turning points very close to each other. The problem is, if you have two turning points very close to each other, the regions surrounding both the turning points where the potential behaves linearly may not extend long enough for the IE functions to actually achieve the asymptotic behavior. So in such cases, where turning points are very close, the kind of connection formulas that we have used is actually not a very good approximation. Now, that is not to say that you cannot use a WKB method there, but this simple-minded WKB method using just the simple connection formulas that we have been using cannot really be used for such systems. You can, for example, approximate the potential not by two linear segments near the two turning points, but by a single parabola and solve that problem for the parabola exactly and use that to derive a connection formula. Work such as this has been done over the years and there have been several improvements over the standard WKB method. In fact, the WKB method and its cousin or its superset, to be more precise, the bunch of semi-classical methods is still a matter of active research and quite a lot of work is still being done on this. One more place where this connection formula sometimes needs to be modified is in the fact that both of our sinusoids in the classically allowed region had the same argument. So one was cosine, the other was sine. Basically, these two particular trigonometric functions had a phase shift of pi by 2. Once again, this would work fine if your linear region extends to a large enough distance so that the asymptotic behavior of the ID functions can be assumed. Quite a lot of workers have actually shown that if you do not use this pi by 2 phase difference between the two sinusoidal pieces, 
but allow the phase difference between these two pieces to depend on the system and calculate this phase difference using some other arguments, you may be able to get a much better approximation for the system. Now, as I've said, this is a lengthy and complicated topic and there are lots and lots of things which are still being discovered about it. So I will not lengthen this any further. We have seen quite a lot about the WKB method in the last few lectures. It is time now to move on to our next topic, which will be time-dependent perturbation theory.